Good evening. Uh, I'm Graham Allison and uh, the director of the Belfer Center. And uh, uh, I'll be uh, interviewing, I think that's what uh, Governor Richardson suggests would be the format to start with uh, the governor tonight. Then we're going to open it up for general conversation. Let me remind you at the outset, this is a good time to turn off your Blackberry cell phones, other things that might make a noise uh, during the session. It's a great opportunity to have here with us tonight uh, Bill Richardson. Uh, I don't know, if, the, oh, only one problem with, the, with him is whether you're supposed to call him governor, uh, you're supposed to call him uh, ambassador, you're supposed to call him secretary, you're supposed to call him congressman. Uh, Bill is one of the most unusual public servants whom I've had the good fortune to know since he was a student at the Fletcher School uh, back here in the Boston community uh, some decades ago. But from that, he has had a public sector career that really goes across the, the spectrum. So he was a member of Congress. He was Secretary of Energy under uh, President Clinton. He was ambassador to the United Nations. He's just finished uh, his term as governor of New Mexico. He's been a presidential candidate. Uh, so uh, how often do we have, as uh, members of this community interested in public service, somebody who's seen this many stops along the way? And maybe that's actually a good place to, to, to start. I'd say uh, uh, if so. Imagine you were a student now, as compared to when you used to be, and actually would have come here to a forum. And so he says, okay, so which of these should I aspire to be? Yeah. Or what's the pros and cons of one rather than the other? Uh, here at halftime in your public service career, what, what, to, what to recommend among these? Well, I, uh, I've been very fortunate to, to have all of these jobs. You might also think that I can't keep a job, so you keep moving. <laughs> Um, I would say the best job I had was governor because you're able to set the agenda. Uh, in New Mexico, uh, the issues of children, education, health care, building a new economy. Uh, as a governor, you run the show. You propose to the legislature. So that was the best job. The cabinet is a very good job. But you've got uh, two constituencies you have to satisfy. One is the president. And you better have a good relationship with the president if you're a cabinet member. If you don't, you're in trouble. The second constituency is the White House staff that tries to tell you how to do your job. Um, the UN ambassador was a great job because you're, uh, you're an American, uh, the most probably powerful ambassador because of the contributions the U.S. makes to the U.N., which at the time was a problem because we weren't paying our dues to the U.N., so I wasn't listened to that much. But you're a member of the cabinet as U.N. ambassador. You sit in the national security meetings, but you still have to deal with the Department of State, which sometimes is not easy, especially for a politician. Uh, member of Congress is a great job, but you're one of 435 I know Congressman Stupak is here, Congressman English. Uh, they may tell you more about what it's like. I love being a congressman. But you're one of many, and my love at the time was the environment and foreign policy. And you can exercise foreign policy more as, uh, as a member of the executive branch. So uh, that's what I would say, uh, Graham. Governor is the best job. I recommend it to every one of you. Uh, and uh, in, in your identification of the constituencies for your, as a cabinet officer and secretary of, the energy, of energy, you said the president, I got that one, you better have a good relationship. The White House staff, I can remember you were, had some difficult times, but in any case, you managed that. Some people would say that there was a third one that was fairly important, and Congress. So since you were a member of Congress, what about that? That's not really a constituent, or... It is. Well, yeah, Congress plays a very important role, obviously, and uh, you have to deal with the appropriators that control your budget. At the time, my appropriator was Senator Pete Domenici, uh, a Republican from New Mexico. He didn't particularly like me, so 
he was the chairman. Uh, we, we, it was sort of a love-hate relationship, mainly on the hate side. <laughs> no. no, but we were kind of rivals uh, over the years in, in New Mexico. He's a very, very important and good person. But, you know, there was that little tension. And he was the appropriator. Uh, but yes, obviously the Congress. But I found in the budget, when I was Secretary of Energy, that most of the discretionary funds at the Department of Energy were earmarked. In other words, the Congress had already decided how to spend them. So I, could ha I had very little say in how to spend those discretionary funds because so much would go. I remember one was for the study of marine mammals which I don't know why the Department of Energy was doing, but we were, because we were mandated. Um, and so that was supposed to be funny, I guess not. Uh, but um, so, of course, the Congress is, is a major player, and uh, you have to be very accountable to, to the Congress. You have to build support for your goals. And, and energy is bipartisan, so you have to be sure that you build that bipartisan support. And at the time, the job of Secretary of Energy was about 70% of it was managing our national labs. I kind of envy the current Secretary of Energy who can do renewable energy, has lots of bucks for, uh, for green uh, projects, for uh, climate change. And uh, it, it, when I was Secretary, most of my job was basically managing the national labs, which sometimes I didn't do very well. But we don't have to get into it. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe come back to that. The, the, uh, one of the, the most fascinating parts of your career has been the dealing with issues across the whole spectrum. So if it's a foreign policy issue, you've been extremely interesting, interested. If it's an energy issue, you've been extremely involved. If it's a climate issue, you've been very much involved. If it's uh, education, uh, if it's immigration. So you've dealt with this ex you know, very broad range of issues. Let's start with Libya, currently. So the current ambassador to the UN, the job you had, Susan Rice, has been one of the major advocates of uh, deeper US involvement in Libya, including airstrikes. So airstrikes, yes or no? Boots on the ground, yes or no? Airstrikes, yes. Boots on the ground, no. I believe the president uh, made the right decision in uh, outlining his policy, maybe a little bit late, but he did say he favored uh, the airstrikes, uh, a limited military in intervention authorized by the UN Security Council, which is very important, which has not been done in the past in military operations, uh, and the objective to avert a humanitarian disaster. I remember previous presidents, President Clinton, once saying that one of his biggest regrets was not intervening to stop the genocide in Rwanda. And I believe the situation in Libya, had we not intervened, it would have been a, a huge, massive a humanitarian disaster. So uh, for that purpose, in a limited way, uh, within NATO, uh, and I believe Libya is important to North Africa, to, to our European allies, to France, to Italy, to Britain, to others, uh, to the Arab League, to Arab countries, to the United, uh, the, the, the OAU, the Organization of African Unity. Uh, and so I believe it is justified. Now, um, what is going to happen, the end game? Uh, that's where I believe it's very important to uh, have an end game. My prediction, it's a prediction, is that Gaddafi's own military will force him to go into exile. Where will he go? to one of the favorite spots in the world, Zimbabwe. Uh, with, uh, that's supposed to be funny too, what's that? <laughs> with Mugabe, uh, maybe he'll go to Venezuela, maybe he'll go somewhere that uh, a, a fellow, a fellow uh, dictator will, will take him. That's what I hope will be the outcome. And I suspect that'll happen. The fact that his foreign minister defected, a very significant player, by the way. Uh, this is somebody that was participating in getting rid in Libya of the weapons of mass destruction, which the Bush administration negotiated, which I give him credit for. I believe it was the right thing. He was also involved negatively in the Lockerbie issue. So this guy has a, uh, 
a mixed record, but he's immensely powerful. And the fact that he's defecting, that he's leaving, shows that maybe he's seeing tea leaves. And I would hope that our intelligence people really move and try to get as much intelligence from this man about Gaddafi's intentions, about the state of the readiness of their military, about their planning, et cetera. But still, so one option is we get lucky or we're fortunate in any case, he slips in the bathtub or military gets him out, he's gone. That's option one. Option two is he stays. Uh, and now the story goes on. So the next question is, should we arm them? And then if you give the guys arms, if you give me a rocket launcher, I'm sorry, I'm not trained. So then we need to train them. And then if their training is not succeeding, you want to have advisors. Advisors are not working. You want to send troops. Or So where do, how, how far down this ladder do you want to go? I was hoping you would have ended with that last question. But my, my view is, uh, look, I, I know we're involved in Iraq. We're involved in Afghanistan. Our military, our great military is overstretched. And I think the last thing the American people want is a substantial involvement in a Muslim country anywhere. However, uh, I do believe that if there is a debate within the administration of providing training to the rebels, or maybe airlifting weapons to the rebels, or uh, possibly uh, some small arms uh, through a third country, or a covert action, since it's been debated publicly, of assisting the rebels, uh, as long as it's no boots in the ground, uh, as long as it's part of a NATO effort, as long as NATO countries contribu contribute substantially more, I would say yes. Okay. So sneakers on the ground are okay, just not army boots. <laughs> uh, I think we should stay tuned on this one. It'll be interesting to watch. One of the uh, fascinating parts of Governor Richardson's career, if, he, if governor was his best job, that's what we'll call him, uh, has been that in his spare time, or between jobs from time to time, he uh, has had this inclination to get on a plane and go uh, to unusual places, usually places where uh, the leadership is rather roguish, and uh, talk to folks, sometimes negotiate with them, frequently bring back hostages, uh, but sometimes dealing with a foreign policy issue, often to the consternation of whatever government is in power at the time, uh, sometimes maybe uh, with, a, with their uh, approval, uh, more frequently with their discomfort, maybe sometimes forbearance. So uh, let's do just a quick video clip here if we can from December. This is the end of his, uh, uh, his term as governor, but in which he's off in North Korea. Can we get sound as well? out. So every negotiation we've had has, has every time I've dealt with them, I, I try to treat them with respect. I try to be honest with them, but we've had success in dealing with them. We got an American pilot out, we got an American prisoner out, we pushed some nuclear negotiations, I got the remains of some of our soldiers out. So every negotiation we've had has, has worked. And somehow, uh, whenever they have difficulty dealing with either the Bush administration, the Obama administration, they kind of call me. Uh, you know, there's a joke that, uh, uh, Ornery people like Bill Richardson. <laughs> okay. So uh, we were we were doing this earlier this week. Uh, so what is the uh, your special rapport with ornery or roguish people? How do you well, explain I, that? The, the quote I used uh, it, actually, President Clinton said that bad people like me, so send Richardson. Um, it started out years ago in Burma when I was able to work with the Burmese generals at the time to get uh, to help with Aung San Suu Kyi 
the Nobel Prize winner, uh, into house arrest. And I was allowed to see her and, and talk to her. And then, um, unofficially, I was sent to, 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 to Iraq. There were a couple of American, uh, there were a couple of American contractors. And I was sort of semi-official from the Clinton administration. We were able to get them out. In North Korea, I happened to be there at the time that an American pilot was shot down. Um, what, what is it about dealing with uh, dictators, with tyrants, that, I don't know, that, that it maybe has, has made me known for doing this? One, I, I said it, I treat everybody with respect. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not a traditional diplomat. I'm not a State Department pinstripe, although I, did, I do have a pinstripe suit. That, that, that goes with talking points and, uh, and follows instructions. I, I try to connect with the bad person, the dictator, find ways of there's common ground. I try to learn as much as I can about what makes this person tick. I try to let the other person uh, save face in a negotiation. But I focus on the objective. It's getting an American serviceman out or, or negotiating a, a, a peace agreement. Um, I think it's very important that uh, when you negotiate that you be honest, that you say, look, I'm just uh, one person. I'm not representing the country that is going to all of a sudden, because if you do this good deed, it's going to change the relationship with you. I remember with Saddam Hussein, uh, I said to him, look, the sanctions are going to continue. You're not America's favorite. That's going to continue. But if you release these two Americans, you'll get a day of good press. And that's about it. And he kind of looked at me saying, well, that, that's not very good. <laughs> but, but we did get him out. And this was after, Graham, I'd made a terrible mistake. And I sat in front of Saddam Hussein. And I hadn't read my briefing papers where they said, for God's sakes, do not cross your legs and show him the sole of your shoes. So that's the first thing I did. And he was looking at me, and all of a sudden he stormed out and left. And Tariq Aziz, you recall Tariq Aziz, said to me, uh, I was a congressman, you committed a mortal sin. You insulted the president, he's left. You must apologize when he comes back. So he came back. And instead of apologizing, I didn't apologize. I continued my respectful ask of wanting the Americans back. And I think he looked at me and, and respected that, that I wasn't groveling, that I wasn't, oh, I'm, I'm a cretin, I'm a terrible dummy. Uh, I think he respected that. And then we started talking more. And in the end, he, he released uh, the two Americans. And, and I remember what he told me by virtue of the Iraqi constitution, I'm releasing the two Americans. And, and I just jumped over like that. All his security guards converged on me thinking I was about to do something violent. And we stood up, and all the press came in. The two Americas came in. And uh, he kind of looked at me and said, you know, this photograph that we're taking is not good for me. And I said, well, Mr. President, uh, this photograph with you for me is not very good for me either. <laughs> but anyway, sort of like a human connection was established. I don't like to brag about it, but I think that helped in that negotiation. So uh, I can't remember the list of all the uh, attractive people you've dealt with, but so we, let's do Saddam, okay, in Iraq. We have Kim Jong-il in North Korea. There's this genocide guy, Bashir, in Sudan. You've been there, yeah. Uh, Castro. Uh, I'm sure I've left out two or three others. So... Uh, Milosevic. Milosevic, okay. Uh, how did you miss Gaddafi? You know, there, I was going to go to Libya once, right after the Bush administration got rid of the weapons of mass destruction in that negotiation, but I didn't do it. Uh, instead, some of his ministers came to New Mexico, and they went to a couple of other states, but, but I never went there. And uh, it, it, It's something that I wish I'd had a chance to meet the guy. But, but he's typical of many uh, dictators out there. Uh, they're, they're, they're very unpredictable, impulsive, uh, emotional, mood swings. Uh, 
they, they think that everything they do is right and, and is godly. And, but I can see the patterns in his behavior with many other people like that that I've met. So let's imagine that uh, for whatever reason you were parachuted into uh, Tripoli tonight and now you're going to see Gaddafi. So what are you going to do? I'd say, you know all those bad things I said about you on TV? They're not true. No. <laughs> now, you, you have to, uh, I would say, um, I, I'd be on, I said, Mr. President, it doesn't look good for you. You've got the allies, uh, NATO, airstrikes. You've got your own people that want you out. Uh, I would say uh, your family uh, is... Uh, if it is important to you, uh, I think it's important that you exit your country and that you leave voluntarily. And hopefully by then there will be some country that is ready to, to take him. That's what I would say to him. I would be straight. And he would rant and rave probably, and, and, and he would probably give reasons as to why we're the aggressors and justify his position. And I'd say to him, uh, I think it's just a matter of time, and you should make your deal now and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Sounds like pretty good advice to me. But, uh, we're going to come to questions from the audience, and so for people that disagree, you can start thinking. I still have a couple more questions here. So uh, as God, when you were Secretary of Energy, you were extremely interested in nuclear energy and we're, the Secretary of Energy has responsibility for civilian nuclear power uh, uh, development and research and a lot of the activity. Um, and then in New Mexico, you made a, uh, I mean, green, clean was one of your strongest commitments. So now we see uh, Fukushima and the uh, unfolding nuclear crisis. What, what does this lead you to think about the role of nuclear in the portfolio for uh, energy sources for the U.S. and for the world? Well, the messages of Fukushima are, are many. One is that uh, we should really consider what has happened in the last year with our fossil fuel energy production. An accident in the... The Gulf of Mexico, uh, an explosion, horizon, an oil spill, devastating. Uh, mining disasters in, coal mining disasters in uh, West Virginia, killing people. Uh, pipeline explosions in California. Um, and now Fukushima. These are our sources of energy and, and we've got to find ways to debate and have a conversation on the safety and issues relating to the environmental risk of these facilities. Obviously, we're not going to end fossil fuels. But I, I think if there's one message that comes forth after this disaster is that America has to dramatically shift to renewables and to natural gas. That, that is the main message. That we can't favor as we have oil, coal, and nuclear at the expense of uh, of natural gas, of renewables, of solar, and wind, that there has to be at the very least, although I would favor a preference for renewables, um, a, a stronger commitment towards them. Now, nuclear is 20% of our energy supply. We've got 104 plants, nuclear reactors. We've got thir in 31 states. And so you're not going to end nuclear, but I think this commitment that some have to build more and more nuclear plants. This is a time to review this, to say time out. We're going to look at issues of safety. At the very least, the 104 plants that exist, intensive by the Nuclear Regulatory Committee, intensive safety and preparedness, uh, very strong reviews. Number two, I think we got to be careful about licensing any future plants, which uh, the administration wants to do, and the, and the president has put forth a budget request of loan guarantees and I think a, an additional 30 plants. I think we got to say, if we're going to build any more, for God's sakes, and we're going to commission new ones and decommission the ones that aren't working, 
let's not build any in any seismically active areas. That's number one. Number two, let's look at the containment vessels of, uh, of plants in earthquake-prone areas. Let's look at the 30% of nuclear plants that have that Japanese technology that's faulty. So this is an intensive review that we have to do. Let's look at the spent fuel, uh, uh, make sure that at each plant we have viable efforts to oversee the spent fuel that is there. Let's have sensible evacuation plans in case of a disaster. I'm not sure we have that. As a state, we look to the federal government to make that happen. So I guess in summary, I believe that nuclear power has to be part of the mix, but, but we have to, this is the time to do a, a very strong safety health hazard review and this is something that the Congress and the administration should join together in a bipartisan way. This is not politics. This is what's good for the country. Let me push one more, one, one more uh, layer deeper on this one. So I agree with all of that. But if one's concerned about greenhouse gases and the impact of burning coal and oil uh, in terms of the concentration of CO2 in the environment and therefore the likelihood of climate change, which I would say the scientific consensus is. And if one therefore is concerned about blowing through 450 parts a million by 2050, which on the current trajectories we are going to do, the only way of hoping not to exceed that was to have nuclear as about one-seventh, one of the wedges, as you know, in the alternatives. So uh, here we are post-Fukushima. One possibility is to say that one-seventh is not good, that, and that one-seventh includes a lot of new nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. So to say, forget about it, that's not going to happen. And now either too bad for the 450 parts per million or make it up in some other category. So how, how do you wrestle with that? Well, I, I've, I'm not for a moratorium on nuclear, I am for a timeout and let's review the strategy. Uh, I'm not somebody that says we, we've got to end nuclear power, but I do think that we need, at the very least, a commitment in this country to recognize that the cleaner sources are the ones that we should favor. And the cleaner sources are uh, solar, wind, biofuels. Uh, let's develop new clean coal technology. We've got these magnificent national labs let the labs also develop a solution. Uh, and, and Graham, one of the, let me just say this about nuclear power, it doesn't emit greenhouse gas emissions, that's great. But we also have a problem with the waste. What do we do with the waste of, in the 104 plants? We don't have a solution. We had Yucca Mountain in Nevada, but uh, that's ended for whatever reason, politics, science. Uh, and so the current proposal is let's, uh, bury this waste in the existing 104 sites. Well, that's a slight problem because nobody wants this waste from the 31 states. So I say this is a, a, a way for our technology, our scientific best minds at our labs to try to find a solution to what we do with the waste. Uh, this is the time when technologically and we have to get an innovative policies to ensure that solar and wind, which I think are the best, but they're still a bit expensive. Let's face that. Uh, that we uh, honestly debate these issues and also throw in the safety issue. I mean, this oil spill, uh, I believe, could have been averted. Uh, and, and technology could have been averted and, and, and eliminate some of the politics in that uh, agency that was there that, that didn't do its oversight. So uh, I think we got... Energy is one of those issues. Every president talks about it. We gotta go renewable, we gotta lose, lessen our dependent on fossil fuels, but then the political will never is there for this to happen. And the citizenry, you guys that pay the gasoline taxes and want energy efficiency, I, I, I don't see the uproar. I don't see the, the citizen commitment to, to, to put pressure on politicians to act appropriately. You saw uh, a 
President Obama's energy speech yesterday, I presume, or, or read it. And he, he laid out two big goals. First, he says, U.S. oil dependence, he's going to cut by a third in little more than a decade from now. And secondly, all federal agencies would purchase 100% alternative fuel hybrid or electric vehicles by 2015. Now, you and I have listened to this story since I think it was Richard Nixon who declared energy independence. Now, every successive president has declared that we're going to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. And uh, at the end of every president's administration, our dependence has increased. And almost all have favored alternatives. And alternatives now, when I do my chart of sources of energy, are this teeny little sliver. So is this realistic or? I think of all our presidents, President Obama has been the most forceful and strongest when it comes to uh, shifting to fossil fuels. He's got the most expansive climate change, greenhouse gas emission policy. Uh, I, I want to tell you, I'm very proud in New Mexico by executive uh, uh, decision of the Environmental Improvement Board. We have greenhouse gas emission standards, Kyoto. We're the only state that does. My successor is probably going to end it. But uh, I'm very proud of that. And, and we're the clean energy state, although the governor of Cal California says that he is. Um, oh, you're finally laughing. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, Graham, I, I just think that you got to give credit to the president. He's trying. It's just a good energy bill. Most of it was good. Passed the House. Then, you know, the Senate changed. Uh, I think he should try again. I was pleased with his speech. His goals are good. Um, his commitment is good. It's just the, the political system. We had a, a, a talk here. I'm, I'm a fellow here at Harvard for five days and like I have about 20 speeches I have to give a day. One of them was on why can't we be more bipartisan? What do we need to do to be more bipartisan and deal with these solutions? Stupak was there, Congressman Inglis was there, Republican, Democrat. And I think that's what you need in our body politic right now more than ever. We can't get anything done. And governors, I'm not saying we are superior, but we are. Uh, we, you know, we have to get along. We have to, by law, balance budgets. We've got to work with Republicans to get things done. I'm not saying you transfer all the power to the states, but somehow, you know, the federal government, the Congress, the executive branch need to find moduses of working better together. And you academics here at the Kennedy School, you guys figure it out. Give us some ideas. You're the thinkers. You're the smart guys, the smart women. W where are the ideas? See, I just threw a problem to you. Well, let, me, let me stay with it one more second. So I would say there are plenty of smart women and men at Harvard, and they may come up with pretty good policy designs. So policy wonks we have. Understanding of politics, I would say uh, the community should be more modest. Okay? And take the climate uh, energy conundrum for a second and help and illuminate it for us a little further. So here we have uh, Gore's Inconvenient Truth and a high degree of public consciousness of the climate issue. In the campaign, President Obama makes it a big, big item. As he becomes president, he makes it a big item. Secretary Chu, who has your job, big push. Congressman Markey from here and Waxman in the House pass a pretty ambitious cap-and-trade bill. Uh, so now that's in 2009. We come now to 2011. If I look at what worries Americans, when you do the list, climate is down at the bottom. Uh, as a congressman told me the other day in Washington, if you want to make sure to kill a bill, put climate in the title, and it's dead on arrival. So tell us about the politics of it. Well, look, I, uh, where's Congressman Inglis from South Carolina, a Republican? Did he walk out? Well, will you get him back here to, <laughs> but look, I, you know, this is like energy policy is like health care. 
um, there's so many special interests that everybody says, oh, I want my deal. I want to keep the good, because my stuff works for the American people. I tried for eight years, I, I'm not going to shift to health care, to get a universal health care bill, like you had in Massachusetts, like Governor Romney is now running away from. It's a good thing what you did. You covered everybody. And I was trying to do it in New Mexico. I couldn't do it because there are so many special interests. You know, the doctors, the nurses, the HMOs, the, the uh, everybody uh, that's involved in health care. Hospitals, oh, we're the purists here. And, 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 and it's the same, Graham, with energy. You know, it's, it's, you've got all the big special interest groups. I had to fight the oil companies in New Mexico because I wanted to get these renewable standards. Uh, we got, I think, 25% by the year 2020. Um, I had to fight them because they saw this as turf. Um, I had to fight almost everybody to get these initiatives. The best thing is if the oil companies adopt some of these environmental standards and do the research. They have the resources on renewable. That, that's probably not going to happen. So uh, what is needed is, is just, unfortunately, America only acts and Congress moves and the executive when there's some kind of a disaster, and, and that should be the case. Look, I, I can go into the politics. I think everybody knows what it is. They're problems. You know, they're special interests. They're, they're special regions, and I'm not faulting, uh, you know, oil states. They, they have their special interests, but, but we need to find ways to, to, to make bipartisanship uh, the staple of how we get along. I mean, the, I'd like to see a Democratic Party that is, uh, you know, center-left, maybe. I want to see a Republican Party come to the center. Uh, I want to see environmental legislation in the days when Teddy Roosevelt and, and Mac Mathias, they were moderate liberal Republicans, and they would team with Democrats to pass landmark environmental energy legislation. We don't have that anymore. We have the extremes the strongest. And I, I regret it. I, I don't know exactly what to do with it. This is why I think we need some, uh, some of our best minds, our best scientists, our best academics help us develop some solutions? Well, I think that we certainly have a population of academics and uh, students and fellows who are eager to try to work on this, but I think that getting the benefit of judgments from people who have lived through the wars, like you, about how the politics works and how politics changes over time. Now, it is the case that things you know, can look pretty gloomy and then all of a sudden uh, environment changes in a significant fashion. So I think that's certainly one where ideas about the kind of work that could be done in a university that would make some contribution would be valuable. Let me ask one more question, then we're going to the audience. Let me take you back to North Korea, because that's been one of your continuing threads. So I would say the, the uh, prevailing storyline about North Korea and its nuclear weapons ambitions is that the North Koreans are extremely ornery and determined, and they lie steel and cheat, that the Clinton administration tried to deal with them and made an agreement in 1994, uh, and that didn't work. And then the Bush administration said the Clinton administration's arrangement didn't work, and so it confronted them and threatened them with regime change, and that didn't work. So what about that? Well, that's true. Um, but the question is, so what do you do about it? I mean, do we, what I oppose and what I believe is not wise, and I'll say this to Democratic and Republican administration, is here's North Korea. They have maybe six to eight nuclear weapons. They, want, they have 1.3 men in arms. They have missiles. They have uh, landmines all around the DMZ. We have 28,000 American troops on the DMZ in a treaty relationship with South Korea. A little altercation between North and South Korea, and South Korea, as it should, is our ally. But an, uh, but an altercation over artillery and, and, and some kind of little mishap could trigger I believe a, a real 
a real massive war on the Korean Peninsula. That's not in our interest. It's not in our interest for a country like North Korea with an unpredictable leader to have nuclear weapons. So, okay, Bush tried to deal with them. Uh, Clinton tried to deal with them. I will say under Clinton, we had what is called the Agreed Framework in 1994. And for a period of time, while we were giving North Korea food, fuel, light water reactors, economic assistance, North Korea didn't build any nuclear weapons. But then they started to cheat, and Bush came in and said, you know, we're not going to do anything to help these guys. We're going to have regime change. That didn't work. And then to Bush's credit, he switched and started to negotiate again with them. Uh, and then President Obama came in. There were efforts to negotiate. But now it's, uh, you know, let's keep North Korea in a corner. And I believe it's important that the six party countries, China, Russia, Japan, South Korea, United States, that again, you need to engage. You need to talk to them, negotiate. And what I found when I went there, and they invited me, that's why, that's why I went. And it was a very tense period. I found that some of their leaders in the bureaucracy in the foreign ministry in the Defense Department. The old line guys had left that would lecture me for hours about how evil we are, but some pragmatists had come in there. And I spent some time with them saying, do not respond to the South Korean artillery effort, to their military exercises. You're going you're gonna to be further isolated. Just do nothing. And you know what? They listened. I'm not taking full credit for it, but I had a little bit to do with that. And they didn't respond, and I think they have more pragmatic people. So I believe the time has come to go back to them, uh, maybe through South Korea, maybe bilaterally, and say, okay, you know, you te show us that you're serious about wanting to negotiate. That's all I'm saying we should do. And I don't have the answer as to what framework and how we should negotiate. But they're going through a transition period. They've got a new leader who is the son of Kim Jong-il, the third son. We know very little about the guy, the, but the only semi-positive thing about him is he went to school in Switzerland, so he's actually left North Korea for a period of time. But we don't know much about him, and, and this is why I think it's important to engage a, a, a nation state that is hostile, that is capable of doing a lot of bad things, that is uh, enormous starvation there, human rights violations that find ways to engage. That's all I'm saying. On this succession that's uh, uh, apparently going on, uh, one of my uh, friends at CIA who analyzes uh, Korea says he never thought in this world that he would find himself praying for the health of Kim Jong-il. So uh, it may not be better. The, the Microphones are on the ground floor and in the loge. Please uh, stand up. Uh, the rules here are say your name and identification, uh, put your question uh, briefly. No speeches other than from uh, the governor, so please. My name is Therese Rohrbeck. I'm a graduate of Harvard Law School, class of 2008. I currently hold a fellowship at Harvard Law. Thank you for being here this evening, Governor Richardson. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that being governor was your favorite job. So what prepared you to be a successful governor? Well, again, I had the benefit of, uh, to be a governor, you need to learn how to manage people and policies. Um, when I was in Congress, the most you managed was maybe 20 members of your staff. And I admit, when I was a congressman, I knew nothing about management. So uh, a cabinet position managing a huge agency, uh, ma uh, being a congressman and, and starting to learn about management, uh, being at the United Nations, uh, managed a, a larger group of people, that was one. But, but the second, I guess what prepared me is, and, and this is something that I say to Kennedy School students, that asked me, what do I need to do to get into government and politics? 
And I say to you, one, you got to run. You got to run yourself. You know, stop being members of coalitions. By the way, my message to women is you don't run enough yourselves. You should run more. You kind of defer to men. Uh, change that. Uh, the second thing I say is a governor, as I said, I enjoyed the job the most. You know why? Because a governor has power. I like power. Now, don't, don't laugh. I'm saying that I like power to do good things, to be able quickly to build a school or to help a child uh, get immunized or uh, do something about one of my big regrets is that I didn't pass a, a gay rights bill. I came close, but I didn't do it. I did eliminate the death penalty. Uh, I'm very proud of that with our legislature. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm saying is that you have to find ways to, uh, in the past, to build coalitions. You can't do it yourself when you're trying to have a policy. I used to have a lot of town meetings in my political career, testing people, throwing out ideas, getting criticized. And then you move, and then you move decisively. So that's what I think prepared me. I know I gave a rambling answer, but I couldn't oh, resist. I I would underline very much the point about being willing to run for office, which I think is something that many Harvard types find too scary, too uh, risky, too much putting yourself on the line. And I'd say that the, if I'm watching when, when I worked with you when you were Secretary of Energy, the fact that a cabinet officer had some sense for politics not just because they had studied it in the book, because they had actually stood up and people voted up or down. Right. Sometimes up, sometimes down. Okay. Uh, it's a different kind of risk orientation. This gentleman. Hi, um, I'm John Soilo. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, I know you, um, well, before anything else, thank you very much for visiting us here. I know you talked about very interesting things like Libya, but I'd like to ask about um, your own political career. Um, so. As far as my understanding goes, um, you are one of the highest um, profile. You, you, you are one of the um, public servants with a really high profile. Um, what are your future plans, having been governor, having been uh, secretary of energy now? Well, what's uh, next for you? Good, good. You know, I checked the uh, Boston Red Sox. They need some pitching. So. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I said? He was a serious baseball player in another phase of his no, life that I didn't include in the, in the intro. Uh, look, I, you know what I said? Like all of you here, I'm a workaholic, okay? And we all tell each other, oh, we're going to go spend more time with our families. We're going to rest more. Nobody here that, that, that does that, okay? You can, like, give me a nice talk <laughs> on it. You don't do it, right? I guess I'm the same way because one of the things I wanted to do after I left office is I love baseball and I wanted to visit every single major league park. And so far I've been out three months, I haven't visited one. And, but I'm gonna to try to, I did go to spring training. Look, this is what I'm doing, I'm doing four things. One is I'm giving speeches. Uh, and my boring speeches, I'm now getting paid for, so that's one thing that I'm doing. And I think a lot of politicians do that when they leave office. The second thing I'm doing is I, I've signed on with this public, uh, this communications company in Washington called APCO, where I, uh, I spend like one day out of 10 talking to companies that have problems and you know they parade me around and I shake hands and comb my hair. No, I do more than that, but uh, I've joined some corporate and for-profit uh, and non-profit boards. I've, uh, I'm joining some environmental boards, the World Resources Institute, I'm gonna be on their board. Um, and then the last thing that I really like that I'm working on is I wanna set up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the greatest city in the world, Cambridge may be number two, uh, <laughs> is, is a foreign policy center, uh, small, not big that does three things. One, uh, focuses on hostage rescues, uh, rescuing journalists, rescuing Americans, foreigners from 
tyrants and something that, that I've done. The second is uh, ba basically specialize in negotiations with rogue states, North Korea, Cuba, Sudan. I mean, the view that I have that you gotta talk to everybody. Sponsor ways that students and human beings and, and non-traditional players can play in improving relationships. The third is Latin America, which always no one ever asks anything about Latin America, which I think is very important to American interests, security, uh, having a relationship with the, our own backyard, with the southern cone, uh, is very important. And, and we're always preoccupied in the Middle East, uh, we're, uh, Europe, uh, arms control, and, and our own hemisphere, Mexico. Uh, immigration bill, uh, we, we neglect, and I think it's, a, so that's what I'm going to be doing. This gentleman. Hi, my name is Arturo Di Sondo, and I'm a student here at the college. My question is actually on Latin America. Um, given your experience on foreign policy regarding um, being an ambassador, and then your proximity with Mexico as governor, what do you see as a future of U.S. and Mexico relations, given uh, the increased momentum of the war on drugs, the 30,000 lives that it has claimed, and the recent resignation of, of Ambassador Carlos Pascual. You guys are so smart. How do you know all this stuff? <laughs> and if I just add as a footnote the fact that the current pre president of Mexico, Calderon, is a graduate of the school here only five years ago. Yeah. And so is Pascual, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Yes. Isn't he a graduate of? Earlier. Earlier. Well, okay, well, I'll try to answer it as, as quickly as I can because I, I can spend hours on this. My mother's Mexican. You know, I like to tell people that I learned Spanish and English at the same time. It's a great asset that, that you're brought up in two cultures. Any of you that that has happened to you, learn languages. You know, we forget languages. Learn, I think music in schools and languages is so important, and we don't do it. Okay, so no, no U.S., Mexico. Um, I think it's probably one of the most important relationships that we have, but we seem to neglect it. What do I believe needs to happen? Um, again, we're so close, you know, there's that expression that Mexico always has, they're next to a giant, and every time the giant sneezes, it, it causes turmoil in Mexico and the whole hemisphere. That is the case. I think the, the relationship has to be, we gotta start talking about our relationship with Mexico other than immigration and drugs and cartels. There's a lot of good things that we do with Mexico in education, in trade, uh, in healthcare, in border relationships, in environmental cooperation. So that's number one. Number two, um, the relationship right now is basically one that is dependent on what is called the Plan Merida. You know what that is. This is funds that we give Mexico, uh, appropriated by Congress, and training uh, military, narcotics, law enforcement to deal with a massive amount of drugs and cartels in Mexico. W what I believe we need to do is, uh, there are two problems with that. The U.S. has to admit that one of the reasons Mex there's this drug problem is that we're the one causing the demand. <laughs> we're not, we sometimes forget that. But at the same time, uh, we permit a lot of weapons to go into Mexico, very, very uh, weapons that are deadly in, in terms of, uh, that cartels use. We also, don't share intelligence properly with Mexico about some of the cartels. There's gotta be more an effective intelligence sharing. And Mexico has a problem that a lot of their law enforcement uh, has some corruption problems. I do think President Calderon has been forceful, he's been strong, he's tried to become a leader in, in dealing with the cartels. Uh, I think there's some similarities with Colombia that could be adopted policies that Colombia did. But I think what, what this means for us as Americans is a whole debate on the war on drugs. Now, I'm not there yet, but there are a lot of very responsible leaders. Uh, the former president of Spain, 
uh, Felipe Gonzalez, former presidents of Mexico that say the answer to the drug trade and substance abuse is to legalize the drugs on the border. I'm not there yet, I don't agree. But it's a debate that we need to have because uh, you know, just our war on drug policies uh, I don't think have been working. And what we need is, in this country, I've always felt on substance abuse, you know, we focus on the law enforcement, the incarceration, but we don't focus on treatment. We don't focus on education. We don't focus on rehabilitation. We need to do more of that. What do you think? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it should be a concerted effort because obviously the U.S. does have the demand and it, that's, what it drives, that, that's what drives Mexican supply. But I, I mean, I'm from Texas, so it's very easy to get a gun in Texas as well. And so they do bring the guns back. So I, I just think they, they should really focus on, on cutting that down. You know, and, and on the legalization issue, and I, I don't know, Graham, you may want to take a poll here, but I, I don't, I'm not there yet. I don't agree because law enforcement is so against it. And, and I, you, you gotta have law enforcement be supportive of something like this, and it isn't, so. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's one of those issues that's just sort of bubbling there. And I think the, uh, I was at a, a meeting in um, Mexico back in last November or December with President Calderon and a you know, leading group of, uh, of Mexicans. And I was quite surprised that the, these were business leaders as well as academic leaders and others, that they were pretty, I would say two thirds of them thought there would be no solution to the problem without some form of legalization. So the, the concept's out there. This lady's next. Yes, um, my name is Carolyn Nelbandian. I've been teaching with the University of Connecticut and uh, I noticed uh, on our program it mentions you'd been ambassador to the UN and I hope my question isn't an unfair one. I ask it respectfully. Why is it been the case that the United States has allowed some time to go by without paying its dues? Well, we have paid our dues in the last four years, but when I was there, uh, I remember Senator Jesse Helms, you remember him, he said that we shouldn't pay our dues to the UN because he and others disagreed with what the UN was doing. That made my job slightly difficult when I'd say, well, we should do this. Well, you know, Mr. Ambassador, when you're paying your dues, we were paying about, a th it's about a third that we pay, or maybe it's a little more. Um, I, I am a big believer in the UN, I am. It's got its faults, its management faults, uh, but one of the things that I believe we need to do at the UN is the world has changed. The members of the Security Council, the five permanent members that have a veto power, France, Britain, the US, China, and Russia, there are other major power centers in the world that are not part of this. And what I would propose, and I proposed this when I was UN ambassador, uh, I got the President, Secretary Albright, to agree to it, is that the world has changed. And there should be more countries represented as Security Council members. But don't give them veto power. That was the compromise. Give the veto power to the five permanent members. And so I proposed, and then I'll tell you where I made a mistake. I propose that Asia have a representative, Africa have a representative, and Latin America. These are, uh, with the permanent members, these, this would round out the world. Well, uh, so then I said like a good Democrat, like a good Harvard, well, I had been a professor there, so. I said, okay, instead of the big powers choosing who in this continent should be the representatives from the various third world parts of the world, I said, okay, let the Asians pick somebody. Let the Africans pick somebody. Let the Latin Americans pick somebody. So what happens? Uh, Africa says, South Africa should be us, Mandela. Nigeria said, no, no, it should be us because we have the oil. 
So they couldn't agree that was Africa. Then Latin America, Mexico, no, Brazil, we're the new emerging power, biofuels. They couldn't agree. And then India and Pakistan. India said, no, no, we're the Asian representative. And then Pakistan said, well, no, well, we think we should be. So uh, I think there's got to be a way to make the UN more representative, more inclusive. But the UN does a lot of great work. And I know you don't have seminars on what the good stuff the UN does. They do a lot on behalf of women's rights, on climate change. They do a lot of great work on, on uh, uh, sexual abuse and protection of kids from prostitution. They do a lot of work on malnutrition and diseases and AIDS and uh, you know just a lot of work that goes unnoticed that is so necessary, pandemic diseases. Ban Ki-moon has come here on several occasions. So in this community, I think you would find a slightly more enthusiasm for the UN than perhaps in New Mexico. This lady. Hi, thank you so much for coming to see us, Governor Richardson. Last time I saw you was at the All Indian Pueblo Cultural Center um, with tribal leaders and then candidate Obama back in 08 and uh, yeah. doing work with the Native Voice. And now I'm here as a mid-career student. My name is Lisa King and I have constituents like you and I sent a message home saying, um, Bill Richardson's here, what's the question that's most important to ask, so excuse me while I read. Um, it's been brought to my attention that there is a hearing before the U.S. Court of Military Commission Review concerning the U case of United States versus Al Bahlul, an alleged Al Qaeda operative being detained at Guantanamo. Apart from the merits of this case, there's been concern raised about the, quote, characterization of Native American resistance to the United States as, quote, much like modern day Al Qaeda as the court seeks to compare contemporary terrorist actions to so-called seminal wars of the 1800s. Now, this is kind of the buzz going on in Indian country right now, and I know that you have a lot of friends and relatives at home um, who represent that constituency, and I was wondering, in light of Obama's apology resolution to Native American tribes, what do you suggest to our friends and loved ones out there would be the appropriate action in response to this? You know, New Mexico, where 11% is Native American. It's the only state with a minority um, population uh, as a, a, a majority. In other words, 43% Hispanic, 11% Native American, 3% African American, I think 1% Asian American, so we go over the 50. And, and I've tried, you know, as a governor, and you know this, to, to have the strongest relationship any state has with Native Americans, and we've done that. You know, I gave them cabinet status. I appointed Native Americans. We, we respect the treaty relationship nation to nation. Um, and and, and, and I, I can't answer this Al-Qaeda question directly because I, I, I don't have the facts, but I will say to you that there are a lot of issues that this nation of ours neglects about our Native Americans. They neglect the, the treaty relationship that says we got to provide education and health care and, and respect the sovereignty of tribes. We don't do that. Far from it. Uh, we don't respect the fact that uh, there are reparations involved uh, with water, with other natural resources, uh, the trust uh, relationship. Uh, a bill passed the Congress of, uh, is it $2 billion for, for um, energy resources that weren't given to the tribes that still have not been appropriated. Is that right? The Cabal settlement you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you. Tell the folks back home that, that I'll continue to, to fight for them, that I, I'm in a less powerful position to do that. But uh, I hope that Harvard, I don't know what's the case. I was really happy today. I met with a Harvard Latino population. They're strong. They're growing. I guess admissions happened today at Harvard and they admitted a whole bunch of uh, new diversity students. I think that's great. I, I hope here at Harvard there's a Native American presence, a Native American center. And if not, do more. Talk, talk to Graham. This guy is a very powerful guy. Indic Loge, please. 
So first off, thank you very much, Governor Richardson. Um, my name is Narayan Talapragada. I'm a sophomore at MIT. I have a question for you on the politics of alternative energy. So it seems that, you know, right now, there's a lot of good work being done in the executive branch at the DOE through ARPA-E and these other programs in promoting alternative energy research and in trying to, I guess, further energy policy. But the hopes for any sort of comprehensive legislation seem very dim. So do you see this as a problem? Do you think a lot of what we need to do can be accomplished within the executive branch provided you know, Obama or someone friendly to these policies stays in power? Or is there a major role for Congress to play in the next few years in trying to get us to where we need to go? Well, the first thing I want to say is, by the way, I've seen some of the work you guys are doing at MIT on energy. It's first rate. Do you know Dr. Moniz, I, Ernest Moniz? I do. I mean, not personally well, he's very doing well, a lot, but I've but, seen him. But I want to just say to you that they do, you're doing very good work at MIT. He's the chairman of the nuclear engineering department there. And it's uh, he's the chairman of the MIT Energy Initiative. In, and in the energy of issues. Yeah. And he was Bill's he was my undersecretary. undersecretary. Ernie Moniz, he looked like, he looked like uh, what's the name of the great scientist? He, he's he a funny a lot of hair hair. Einstein. Einstein. He's as smart as Einstein. <laughs> um, you, you neglected one component. See, what many states did when the federal government didn't act, we moved with renewable energy policies on our own, creating transmission authorities, creating uh, exchanges between states. California did this, New Mexico did this, several western states, some here in the northeast too. Um, I think the first step is that if there's congressional inaction, you want the states to move. But then the second thing that we need to do and what I'd like to see in America is what happened in the Middle East with you young people and with Twitter and Facebook and the internet is somehow that you, the young people that, uh, and the independent voters that elected the president, that you take up a cause, and that is uh, diversification of our energy sources, a push to renewable energy, that you make it a citizen's movement. I don't know if it's possible, but that is the best way for politicians to listen. And uh, I, I just think it's so important and so needed right now. We're, we're coming close to the end, and so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this question and then your question. Then we're going to let the three that were up all ask their point quickly, and we'll look. But we're going to take this question short, question short answer, for, and this one and this one, then we'll see who else. Thanks. Hi, my name is Adar Dagos, and I'm a freshman in the college. I've actually lived in New Mexico for two years, and beautiful nature, I loved it. Um, I was going to ask, so as you navigated through the realms of politics, what, were, what, was, like, what was a significant challenge you faced, especially one that you think you have failed, and how did you take it, and how did you deal with it? My biggest challenge was, uh, legislation that came to my desk to repeal the death penalty uh, in exchange for life imprisonment without parole. I had always been for the death penalty as a presidential candidate, as a congressman, and after a lot of data and soul searching and, and wrenching personal uh, observations of our penal system, which is in bad shape, which I don't believe the state should make decisions that might err on the side of uh, a, a huge mistakes. After interviewing many death row inmates that had been, dis their, their cases had been dismissed because of faulty DNA evidence or uh, bad legal representation or uh, you know, the fact that our, uh, most of our uh, members of, uh, in prison are either black or Hispanic, I'm, I'm not justifying crimes, that, I, that that caused me to reassess my position. And I ended up signing a bill that repealed the death penalty. That was my biggest challenge. And, 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 and for days after, I, I felt, did I do the right thing? And I, I had this soul searching that in the end, I believe I've done the right decision, but uh, that was my biggest single challenge. This gentleman gets the last full question, then we'll take the, the, uh, a, a second lot. But you get a full question, 
and a full answer, but short. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Rodrigo Garza. I'm an MBA student at MIT Sloan and MPA student here at the Kennedy School. Um, my, my question goes back a little bit to, to the Mexico question and specifically addressing the assault weapons issue. Um, there are over 6,000 gun shops set up a mile from the border. It's clear that their target market is cartels. Billions of do blood money being laundered that are killing over 30,000 people in the past four years. Why has President Obama not gone after the assault, to reinstate the assault weapons ban when he clearly stated that he was going to do so in the campaign? And a thousand sheriffs in, in the US are for the assault weapons ban. So it's, it's domestic and international. You know, the champion in the Congress for the NRA was Congressman Stupak, is right here. Uh, was a fellow I at the this, Institute of Politics and very no, friendly. And, and, yes. and, I, and I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, because I, I also, by the way, I was the only candidate in the Democratic primaries, Democrat that was endorsed by the NRA. Didn't do me much good in the Democratic. So, and I'm a Westerner, so I, I understand your question. Stupak, answer the question, will you? <laughs> Give him a perspective. He, he's, he's asking, a, a, I think the president has tried to do this. You can't do this through congressional action. You can, but you don't, they're not, the votes aren't there. I mean, it's just like another, issue that, that maybe there's a way you can do this, huh? Well, well but do say more than that. The, the guy asked a good question. <laughs> uh, I don't think you need an assault weapon to, you know, kill a deer. And I don't think you need all these assault weapons on the border. You're right. There's got to be a dialogue. And, uh, you know, the NRA, I have worked with them in the past on some of these issues. We, we need to come together because it's, it's been a, it, it's, it, it's very much a part of the violence on the border. I mean, I'm not answering your question. I'm admitting that we got to do better. What are you doing about it? You asked me the question. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> So I'm, I'm trying to create consciousness, and there's well, a pr Professor good. Jarding is working good. on uh, gun gun regulation. I'm going to try and work with him. Uh, we, we asked him to trade in his assault rifle when he came as a student. <laughs> so we Unfortunately, we've come close to the end, but we're going to let the people who are standing, please put your question briefly. We're going to take all four, and yeah. you can answer okay. whichever one you want. Yes, okay. please. All right, thank you so much, Governor and Director. My question is regarding information. Basically, anyone with internet access these days has almost too much available to them. So how do you propose that members of Congress either filter their information or interpret and decide which technical advice to take, which you know, business leaders to trust? How could that be consolidated or bettered? You can put your question, please. Um, my question is uh, the role of business um, and making the ask to them for solutions, uh, whether it comes to uh, economics, environment, energy, or healthcare, and what's their role? Okay. I'm Russell, and I'm a second year at Fletcher. Um, I wanted to push back on you on nuclear energy and ask if maybe we're asking the wrong questions. With respect to safety and security right now, the NRC is looking at at least six different nuclear plant designs, which are all small modular reactors or SMRs, which are supposed to be environmentally a little more safe less prone to earthquakes and seismic shifts and uh, proliferation resistant as well, um, as well as you know addressing spent fuel management. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Okay, but, but you're, you're asking me, is the NRC doing the right thing? No, no, rather, when, when you made your comments about the future of nuclear energy, um, you, you, you mentioned that you know, the questions we should be asking is whether or not containment vessels, right, um, right. You know, spent fuel and storage, these sorts of issues. And rather, what I'm asking is, what do you think about the future of SMRs as a part of our energy mix, considering that the NRC is currently reviewing these applications? Of a different technology, which would be the small nuclear reactor. Oh, yeah, right, right, right the small ones. Exactly, okay. the small encased modular. Right. And the final question, yeah? Okay. Thank you, Governor, thank you. Um, my question is, 
when, as is pointing to it, uh, it's a domestic issue. Um, what do you think about what the governor of, of Wisconsin is doing to his state and, and to his people, and, and also how this is affecting our country in that we're becoming much more rigid about you know, that there's some sort of faction that's making diplomacy even harder to do, deal with? Great four questions, and I wish we had the whole night to uh, debate them. You can choose to answer whichever one. Well, I, I have to in, uh, answer Stephanie's because she's my like advisor. She takes care of me, my along with three other very able Harvard students. Um, th there needs to be um, a, a a stronger connection between the internet and members of Congress because a lot of it is filtered through staff although there are some very technically competent uh, members of Congress, I think the future communications that is gonna happen between congressmen and their constituents is gonna be technological, it's gonna be the Facebooks, it's not gonna be the letters that we used to send, you know, with our pictures telling, telling all of you how great we were, and come and meet us. Uh, so I, I do believe we need to find better uh, ways that that communication exists. On, uh, I am for those small reactors. Where are you? The nuclear man. Yeah, I, I think this is good. The, the smaller reactors. I'm for anything that technologically is, is going to work. My, my concern is that we've been relying, uh, that, that relying on old nuclear technology, the water boilers, we just got to find new ways to to deal with this, and, and I hope you are at Fletcher. I went to Fletcher, you know. Good. How are things there, okay? You guys miss me, now you don't. Okay, um, the, the, the other, the, the question about, uh, well, no, I don't agree with the governor of Wisconsin. That's not a way to, to deal with problems. Um, you know, but we got some, I gotta tell you something, and, and I don't wanna get partisan here, but we, we got some real budget problems in this country. We've got to find ways to, you guys all should read the Bowles Simpson report about what we need to do with the deficit. Now it's not pleasant because everything that students depend on, Pell Grants, a lot of it is, is cut and proposed and, 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 and we don't have a dialogue because we got an election coming, entitlements, pensions. We gotta start talking about that and, and Okay, in Wisconsin, I think they went overboard. But uh, again, bipartisanship, and for the young people, you want to have Social Security viable, you want to have for your generations spending on environmental protection and what's important to you. At the rate we're going in this deficit, it, it's just not going to happen. Uh, so uh, I would hope somehow, uh, other than saying, and I always used to say, there should be a constitutional amendment to balance the budget because states do it. Do it over a 15 year period of time. You can't do it in a war or recession. But we gotta start thinking about this. Wh which is the one that I missed, Graham? Bit, uh, business. Uh, oh, business, where are you? That, that is so important. You know, politicians, you're either uh, come from state government or you're a lawyer, not, not everyone. We need more businessmen. I was at the School of Public Health more physicians, doctors, nurses, uh, moms. We, we need more women running. And, and, and one of the, I think, not cures is we need to have candidates more in tune and committed to issues than necessarily to party. I know that's a big proposal that probably, I don't know if it's undoable. I think the two-party system is the best in the world, and I support it. But somehow, you know, some, uh, one, of the, one of the problems we have, uh, Graham, in our body politic is why is it that there's this such division? Uh, I don't think it takes a, a scientist to tell you that the reason there's such a lack of bipartisanship and rancor is because of uh, cable, internet, and the demand by both parties to raise money. And the way you raise money for campaigns is to be divisive and acerbic and different and attack each other. And, and it, it, you know, when Stupak, well, Stupak just left the Congress. I, 
when I was there, Congressman Inglis, but he's gone. Um, we, we used to get along by uh, traveling together. Uh, when I came to Congress in 82, I was told, have your family stay in Washington. Build a, a Washington life. Go home on you know, every other weekend. But now, they arrive like on Tuesday. They have the first vote at 5 o'clock so that they all fly in. And then they leave on the 7 o'clock plane on Thursday. So there's like one day to vote. So they don't get to know each other. So they insult each other and they don't feel bad about it because they don't know each other. So there's a lot of things that could be done to change things. Anyway, I'm well, just a, an unemployed former governor. I think if we go back to the earlier question, uh, I would say that having watched this career, it's about half time. Okay. So it's been a good first half but I think the second half is yet to come. For his coming to visit us tonight as the Lamont Lecturer and as a special fellow at the Institute of Politics, let's say thank you very much to Bill Richardson.